fantastic. Bob, can you sing for me every time I come on stage? That was really fun. Welcome back from lunch. Don't go into a food coma, okay? We can do this. And a special welcome back to the gentlemen who I've not had the pleasure of hanging out with yet. Nice to see you all. Looking good. All right, let's say a prayer to get started here. And so you all stop talking. It works every time. You just pray and everyone's like, oh, quiet, okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray. Jesus, we invite you into the room with us this afternoon as we talk about relationships. Lord, we ask that you open our minds, our hearts, to whatever it is that you've called us here this afternoon to. Lord, we thank you for this amazing gift of this conference this weekend, and I ask that you bless each and every person in this room. May your spirit be with them and upon them. May they know your peace and your love. I ask that this afternoon my words be yours and that I only speak truth, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, in our world today, we value ancient things. Things that are hundreds or thousands of years old. We find them to be fascinating. And I know this because we have these buildings called museums, where we pay good money to go look at old things. Now, one of my favorite ancient things in our world are the redwoods. These are those ancient trees out in the Pacific Northwest. I've never seen them, but it is on my bucket list. I will go see the redwoods, God willing, before I die, right? These trees are amazing. Some of these trees are over 2,000 years old. It just blows my mind to think that there is something that is living and growing today that was living and growing before Jesus was born. That's crazy. And because these trees are so old, they're really big, really big. So big that people will actually carve holes out of the trunks of the trees, not so they can walk through the tree, but so they can drive a car through the tree. Check this out. That's crazy. This tree is estimated to be 2,400 years old and is 315 feet tall. That's taller than the Statue of Liberty, one tree. Crazy, right? So imagine with me for a minute, and then in the middle of the night, some crazy person with a very large chainsaw leveled the redwood forest. I guarantee you that when we woke up the next morning, we would hear about it. It'd be on social media, it'd be on the news, people would be saying, this is like so tragic. Why would somebody do that? Why would somebody cut down these ancient, beautiful, almost sacred trees? And for good reason, too, because they would have destroyed something that would take 2,000 years to grow back, if we could even get them to grow back, and we wouldn't even know because we don't live to be 2,000 years old. So I gotta tell you something. There's this reality, right? Like, our worth and our value, it's, it's not quite like the Redwoods. We're not ancient. We aren't protected in the way that they are through government and things, right? The reality is, that you are actually something more. You're something more. You see, one day these redwoods, all of them will turn to dust. They will be dust, they will be gone. But you, friends, housed inside of you, you have a thing called a soul. And your soul was not created to live for 100 years. It wasn't created to live for 2,000 years. Your soul was created to live forever. You will live forever. That is very hard to wrap your mind around sometimes. Like, what will we do forever, God? I don't quite know yet. A little scary thought, but the truth is, is that you are not ancient. You are immortal. C.S. Lewis once put it this way, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. 
nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. And their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. The redwood compared to you, that thing's a gnat. You will live forever. You are immortal. And if we believe this to be true, then the way that we relate to each other, the way that we treat each other, it matters. Because your worth and your value and your dignity is greater than anything else on this world. You are greater. You're not just ancient. You are immortal. And here's the thing. How often do we forget to treat each other that way? How often do we forget that the person sitting next to us, they're immortal. <laughs> they have an immortal soul that was made to live forever. We ourselves, we're immortal. Immortal souls that were made to live forever. And here's the thing, like it or not, we were made to be in relationship to each other. So if we believe this to be, to be true, then the way that we relate to each other, it matters. It matters. And so what I wanna do today, what I wanna talk about today, are three relationship goals that each of us should have when it comes to the way that we relate to each other. Like I said, like it or not, we're made for relationship. We're made to be in relationship with each other. We were created in the image of a God who is in relationship. God himself is not in isolation. He's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who makes up the Trinity. So if we are made in his image, that gives us a clue that we were made for relationship. So we're going to look at three relationship goals today. And if you live these well, I can guarantee for you a depth in your relationships that you have never experienced before. And it all comes down to the hinge of this, understanding that people are not things, because people have immortal souls. So our first relationship goal is to will the good of others. St. Thomas Aquinas once said, to love is to will the good of another. St. Thomas Aquinas was a philosopher, so what the heck does that mean, right? Okay, let me break it down for you. Last night, Bob put these two chairs up here, and he talks about how God gave us the freedom to choose, right? He said we can turn our chair away from God. We have that choice. The fancy Catholic word for that is free will. Free will. God didn't say you have to be my minion, you have to do what I say. No, he said you have the freedom to choose. So in this context, I want you to look at this way. So to will is loosely to choose. To love is to choose the good of another. To choose what's best for somebody. To want what's best for them. To desire their happiness. And not only in your mind and in your heart, but sometimes in your actions. Your actions reflect that desire, which means sometimes making a sacrifice for somebody else and the way that you live and the way that you relate to them. Several years back, I had a friend who asked me to go on a walk with her. Her name was Sarah. She said, hey, Lisa, I want you to go on a walk with me. Um, I was like, yeah, I like exercise. This will be fun. I'll get some fresh air. Sounds good. So we're going on our walk. And I quickly realized that Sarah wasn't looking to get fresh air. No, she had an agenda. And she said, Lisa, you know, um, something's been going on in our friendship that's been bothering me lately. And I, I really wanted to bring it up because I feel like it's preventing us from authentic friendship and from being better friends. And I was like, yeah, sure, like what's going on, tell me. And she said, you know, I kind of feel like and the things that you say and the things that you do, that sometimes like you're just trying to one-up me. And you're like trying to prove that you're better than me. And I feel like you're kind of in competition with me and I just, I don't know, I, I, something's off and I just want to bring it up and get your thoughts on it. So I listened to her, I'm taking it in and it's my turn to talk. And I was like, nah, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. I, I don't see that. Competing with you, comparing myself to you, no, 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 I don't, mm -mm, that's not me. And the look on her face was like, I think you're delusional, but okay. <laughs> and the reality is, is she was absolutely right. I was comparing my life to hers. I was competing with her. I was struggling with the fact that I looked at her life and I thought, it's perfect. She's got everything together. She's, she's cuter than me. She's more funny than me. She's more popular than me. She probably has better grades than me. I don't know for sure, but you know, probably, because everything's perfect in her life. And I looked at her life and somehow her life to me, sometimes it seemed like a threat. Like somehow her happiness was gonna get in the way of my happiness. 
And in that state of mind, it was really hard for me to truly, honestly, will her good. Because here's the thing, comparison, comparison is the thief of joy. Maybe you've heard that one before. But when I was living like this, when I was constantly comparing myself to her, it wasn't leading to my happiness. <laughs> in fact, it was quite exhausting feeling like I had to try to keep up with her. Like I had to prove to everybody that I was better than her, or at least I could be as good as her. And not only that, but it was affecting our friendship. It was affecting our friendship in ways that were preventing us from really being friends. And for a long time, I lost out on what could have been an even deeper and better friendship with Sarah if I wasn't so focused on just comparing myself to her. And with some time, I did finally come to terms with what I was doing. I was able to recognize like, yeah, 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 that's going on. And I had to con constantly choose to stop comparing myself to her. And choose, it was an act of the will, it was a choice to not compare myself to her. And I had to focus on being me. It's kind of that quote I love from Bob last night where he talked about, don't be a photocopy, be an original. I was like, I gotta work on being an original. And yes, it was hard. It was hard to wrap my mind around that and the whole concept, I'm sure you've heard this before, that you're enough, right? And I was like, I'm not sure about that, but you say so, I'll try it. Try to figure this out. But here's the thing, the world doesn't need photocopies of other people, it needs you. God created you with a specific perfect purpose. Sometimes I can't talk when I'm pregnant, I'm sorry. God created you with a specific purpose. There's a plan for your life that only you can fulfill. Only you can fulfill. And the world needs you to be you. And who you are is enough. So who do you need to stop competing with? Who do you need to stop comparing yourself to? Who do you need to start willing the good of? Because we all have those people in our lives. So I want to give you something very practical that you can do every day. One simple thing. Every day, compliment somebody. Great job on your presentation, that was awesome. Hey, I really appreciate how great of a friend you are to me, thank you for that. Because when we can find the good in people, it makes it a lot easier to will their good. And then you'll start to see them for the immortal soul that they are. So our first relationship goal, will the good of others. Relationship goal number two, refuse to use. When, um, I fly on planes quite a bit. I often get to have conversations with people who I've never met. And recently I was on a flight and there were two girls sitting on the airplane with me. And one of the girls had recently gotten engaged. These were both girls, they were both in college. And she was so excited. And so she's telling this story to the girl in the middle seat and to me, right? And so we're like, tell us the story. How, how do you ask you, you know, do you, where's the wedding? Can we be bridesmaids, right? All these important questions. And so we're going on and we're chatting and having this great conversation. And so that kind of comes to a lull. And so I asked the girl sitting in the middle, because you know, we're talking about relationships, kind of seems natural. I'm like, so are you dating anybody? Do you have a boyfriend? And she gets this funny look on her face and she's like, um, yeah, okay, so, um, okay, so there's this guy and like, so he and I, and, and we were like, so there's like this, um, this thing. Um, it's a really hard time putting words to it. Have you ever seen relationships like this where you're like, uh, how do you define that? What exactly are you? Yeah. Are any of you currently in a relationship? Actually, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. <laughs> so finally, after all this stuttering, she comes up with an answer. She says, okay, we're casually dating. I was like, okay, so what does that mean? Like, you get coffee once in a while, you're getting to know each other. Like, what does that mean? And she says, well, it's like, it's like a friend that you make out with. It's like, okay, <laughs> a friend that you make out with, okay. I said, I got a little bold. I said, okay, so it's like basically a situation where you just use each other? And she goes, oh, well, when you put it that way, it sounds kind of bad. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I mean, you don't know who you're talking to, right? Like, I wrote a book on dating. Um, so I'm like, okay, so like, are you, are you good with that? Like, are you good with the status of this? relationship, this casual dating relationship. And she's like, yeah, it's fine, it's just fine. And then she kind of got real serious. We're cruising over 10,000 feet and she says, 
actually, it doesn't really feel quite right. It doesn't really feel quite right. You see, in the heart of her heart, when she actually looked at the situation, she recognized and realized that she was being used, and she was using. But she didn't quite know what to do about it. She knew that there had to be something better. She knew something was off, but she wasn't quite sure what to do about it. Friends, the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is use. Pope St. John Paul II once said, a person's rightful due is to be treated as an object for love, not as an object for use. And I think we know this instinctually, like, yeah, we're, we're not things, like, we can't just toy with each other, like, that's not fair, right? But how often do we settle for use in our relationships, especially our dating relationships? I think there's two ways that we can do this. The first way is the more obvious way, physically. We can physically use each other. And I think and I hope by now that you've heard that physically using people is wrong. And just like our girl on the plane discovered, it didn't feel quite right. When my husband and I were writing our book, we spent hours interviewing young adults, people who just graduated from college, and we asked them, so what was it like dating in the world today? Over and over again, we heard this same sentiment. It didn't feel quite right. I want to read you one quote from one of the guys that we interviewed by the name of Daniel. He said, when it was just about the physical stuff, there was an emptiness and an uneasiness about it. When it was over, I'd think, that's not right. That's not what I really wanted. We talked to girls, and over and over again, we heard them say, yeah, you know, like in the moment, it was fun, and I felt like I mattered to somebody, and I, I felt like I was important for the moment. But the next day, when I was home by myself, the emptiness was worse. The loneliness only grew. We weren't made to be used. There's another aspect of use that I want to talk about too. There's the physical use, which is more obvious, but I also want to talk about the other side, which is emotional. We can use each other emotionally. Now, before we move on here, I want to make sure that I'm very clear about a few things about the emotions. First things, catechism tells us, so the catechism is that green book that tells us a lot of things about being Catholic. That's the easiest way to explain it. In themselves, passions, and our passions include our emotions, these are our desires that we have, are neither good nor evil. It's not right or wrong to feel a certain way. What matters is what we do with it. Catechism goes on to explain, emotions and feelings can be taken up in the virtues, loosely good habits, good things, or perverted by the vices, bad habits, negative. So either we can use the emotions, the passions that come to us for good, and direct them towards good, or we can allow them to get twisted around and used negatively. And I wanna talk about how our emotions can be twisted negatively in a way that leads to use. And there's two primary ways that I think we do this. The first way is through the emotional high. When I was in high school, I dated a lot of guys that I like barely knew. Like I'd meet them and I'd be like, he's the goat. And like a week later we'd be dating. And like two weeks later I'd be like, well, what was I thinking? Who is this guy? Like he's like not the goat. He's like the grossest of all time. I don't understand what's wrong with me, right? Did I hurt somebody's feelings? She just pointed to somebody. Oh, goats on the back. No, it's greatest of all time. I'm saying that, oh, that's why they groaned. They have t-shirts that say goat on the back. <clears throat> okay. We're going to be okay. I knew there was something going on there. You didn't like my joke. Never going to use that again. Okay, so... The issue was, is that I was in these relationships for the emotional high. I liked, like, the emotional high of the relationship. It was fun, you know? Like, oh, you'd meet someone and it's like, oh, life's exciting, you know? And, and then, like, you'd realize, like, oh, my gosh, there's nothing here. There's no substance. My emotions blinded me from the reality of the situation. And I was just chasing after that high. It led to use. It wasn't about willing these guys good. <laughs> I was like, I really want to help these people become better and love Jesus more. No, that was not on my mind. We use each other emotionally. 
One of the ways is through an emotional high. Second way, a sense of security. It's very easy to use people for a sense of security. When I was in college, I stopped dating guys I didn't know. Got a little smarter. It's good. And after being friends with this guy for several months, we started dating. And about a year into our relationship, though, I had this sense that this relationship was not God's best plan for me. And here's the thing, it was really confusing because we were doing so many things right. Our relationship was chaste, we were praying together, we were trying to keep Christ as a center, but I still had this feeling of this just isn't right. So I broke up with him. And everything was great for like three weeks, and then I had this freak out moment, and I was like, oh my gosh, what if I just broke up with the one? Like, what if he was the one and I just blew it? And now for the rest of my life, I'm going to be a cat lady. And for the rest of his life, he's going to be a cat man. And it's my fault because we're supposed to be together and I just ruined his whole life. And I felt this immense pressure of like, oh, what was I thinking? So in my freak out, we got back together. And we dated again for a couple of months. And that same feeling came back. I just knew. I was like, this is not right. This is not what God desires. Yes, there's nothing like sinful about this relationship, but it's not right. And I knew that if I held on to that relationship, I was holding on to it for a sense of security. And that was not fair to this guy. It was not fair to this guy. Love should not be based in fear. It can't be grounded in grasping for security. Selfless love wills the good of the other. And here's the kicker. Here's where these two things come together for me. Where our hearts go, our bodies want to follow. So if our emotions are saying, oh, I really want to be close to this person, I really want to be near to them, I just want to give them everything, our bodies are going to want to say, I really want to be close to this person, I really want to be near to them, I just want to give them everything. When it comes to purity, when it comes to chastity, it starts with first making sure that we are properly ordering and directing our emotions. Because where our hearts go, it's very easy for our bodies to want to follow. So our second relationship goal is to refuse to use. Third goal, stop judging, start loving. When I first got into my faith, I was, you know, super, um, well, I had like a pair of like zealous, you know, my zealous outfit. And I was like, yeah, I'm so holy. I know what's up. And I remember being in my kitchen one day and my parents, they weren't like yelling or fighting. You could just tell there was like tension going on. And I'm observing this. And because I'm so holy, I was, you know, making judgments about it. And I said, mom and dad, do you pray together? And they looked at me like, who are you? Like, what? Where did that come from? And I said, because if you don't, that's a problem. And they still stared at me, didn't say anything. And I was like, okay, I'm going to leave now. That got awkward. Because here's the thing. I looked at my parents and I was like, huh, clearly if they're having trouble and they're like mad at each other, they're not very holy. I was judging my parents. Yes, that's right. Me and my judgy eyes, right? Don't let this halo blind you, people, okay? Because I'm so holy. People say that Mother Teresa said, I just have to be honest, she didn't really say this, but I don't know who did, because everybody says she did, but she didn't. If you judge people, you have no time to love them. There's a lot of truth in that, though. If you judge people, you have no time to love them. Now, when we talk about judgment, there's two ways that we can look at this. There's judging an action, which is actually important. We need to do that. We need, you know, killing someone is wrong, right? <laughs> we need to do that. We need to look at actions and determine are they good or are they bad, right? But then there's judging a person. And thank God that's not our job. You see, if you have a friend who's struggling with something, maybe they cheat, or maybe they lie, or maybe they're using people in their lives, what they don't need from you is for you to sit there and judge them and pick them apart and think of all the reasons why they're such a horrible person. What they need is your love. They need a friend who's gonna walk with them in their brokenness. A friend who's going to say, listen, I want better for you. You're an immortal soul. <laughs> These things that you're doing in your life, they're not going to make you happy. And I love you enough that I want to take you and help you get to somewhere better. That's an authentic relationship right there. 
I know, this can be hard. It's like, well, how do I do that, right? That's kind of scary. It starts with having a friendship with someone, having an authentic friendship with them, relationship with them, and you call each other out when you need to, not because you're judging each other, but because you're loving each other. And you wanna help each other grow in holiness and become the best version of yourself that you can be. This is exactly what my friend Sarah did with me. She saw something that was going on in my life. She knew it wasn't going to lead to my happiness. So out of love, she called me out. I know what you're thinking. Okay, how do I do that, though? I have a friend I should probably talk to. I don't know how to do that. They'll hate me, and they'll never talk to me again, right? That's a hard thing to give, like, here's exactly what you do. But the first step is you pray. You pray about it. You say, Lord, am I, do you need me? Is this... Is this me? Do you need me to call this person? Do you need me to have a conversation with them? Do you need me to love them with truth and speak truth into their life? And if you know, yeah, yeah, that's what I need to do. That's what it means to be a friend to this person. Then the second question you ask yourself is, can I do it with love? Can I do it with love? Can I speak truth to them with love? Because if you're just doing it because you want to like be right or you want to prove them wrong or something, that's not the reason to do it. But if you can pray about it and you know, yeah, I can approach this with love and you're called to it, then you step out in faith and you do it. And you trust, that, yeah, it might not go the way you want it to go in the moment, right? I think Sarah probably left that conversation and was like, that didn't go very well. <laughs> she told me I don't know what I'm talking about. But I had to think about it, I had to process it, and then I was able to get to a point and say, yeah. Yeah, that's what's going on. And it's not leading to my happiness, and I'm grateful that she did that for me. I'm grateful. So our three relationship goals. Number one, will the good of others. Number two, refuse to use. Number three, stop judging and start loving. And if you look at these three things, the common denominator across them is love. You want amazing relationships in your life? Love. To love is to will the good of another. The opposite of love is use. Stop judging, start loving. If you can do these things, if you can live in this way, you're not gonna see your friends, you're not gonna see the people in your life as things. You're gonna see them as the immortal souls that they are. That person sitting next to you, they're not an ancient artifact stored at a museum. They're not some redwood. They're more. They're an immortal soul that was made to live forever. And their worth and their value is unbelievable. So let's start living like it. I'm gonna invite Bob up on the stage here. Let's give it up for Lisa, that was awesome. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Come over to my office. Yeah. And we got our chairs here. Where are you going? I'm just rejecting Bob. Oh, no, um, someone was supposed to bring me coffee. What do you want? They're, they're getting it. There's supposed to be a coffee for I, me. I know, but it's, she went to get the coffee. It's not okay. ready yet, okay. Baby needs coffee. I know, Bob. it's a pregnant thing. Mm. I'll have to drink my water like a So welcome to Dr. Woman. Bob's relationship show. Lisa, thanks for coming and being a part of it. <laughs> thanks for having me. Yes. We've been, uh, my, my Twitter feed, I'm gonna really regret having given it out to so many human beings. Uh, email's been blowing up. Lots of really good questions, I think, Excellent. and of course, in 16 minutes and 34 seconds, we will answer every single one of them with the fullness of detail that it deserves. Yeah, actually, we'll probably, just, we'll probably just get to three. Um, but thanks for your questions, you guys. There are actually some, some great questions. And first of all, um, uh, wow, that, you know, I, I think all of those points that you're talking about um, really goes down to just the nature of what love is about. You know, I, I, I never heard that before, that the opposite of love isn't hate but it's use. And I think so many times, you know, we can have this emotional love, but you can really tell by its fruits whether or not it's something genuine. And so with that in mind, uh, I might categorize some of the questions because some of them were, were pretty similar. Um, there was a few that asked a variation of how far is too far, uh, what's wrong with casual sex, um, if I love them, is it okay to have sex with them? You know, just, just some of those general things. You began to touch on that, but maybe we can get more specific about that. Sounds good, yeah. Um, I mean, I think really when it comes down to the questions like, well, what about sex outside of marriage or casual sex? Um, I think a lot of what I touched on with, with the use piece, I mean, really, I get, the truth is written on our hearts. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and over and over again, we heard from our interviews people saying like, yeah, like I just, like, it didn't feel quite right. And there's a reason for that because God created us for relationship, he created us for permanency for things like sex. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's something very beautiful about that, that we're denying ourselves if we say, well, no, I know better, right? Like, I know the GPS says to go this way, but I'm gonna drive it through the lake because I think that's faster, right? <laughs> like, right. well, that's not gonna get you where you wanna go, right? Yeah. So like, we need to trust and that God who's written on our hearts the truth, like it's, it's in there, like that's actually gonna lead to our happiness. Um, and I think it can be kind of scary to trust that, but my challenge I always give to people is like, try it. Like, yeah. you wanna know the ultimate test of whether or not someone loves you? Like, are they willing to sacrifice for you? Are they willing to will your good and say, yeah, it might not make full sense to me, but this is what the church teaches and this is what God has, has put on my heart and so I'm gonna trust that there's gotta be something deeper there. Yeah, I think that's you, great. Yeah. yeah, no, and I, I agree. I mean, I think, I think so much of it does have to do with trust and has to do with hope. You know, that if God doesn't have a bigger plan for our life, then just live for the moment. And I think many times uh, in, in those situations, that's, that's really the question. Like, are we willing to put our trust in God enough to abstain in this moment? God really likes sex, by the way. He, he created it. You know, it, it's not like he created man and woman and looked down and was like, oh, myself, what are they doing, right? <laughs> like, um, I didn't, what, no. <laughs> yeah, that happens? <laughs> ah, I can't unsee that for eternity. <laughs> no. Um, you know, obviously he created it with a plan and he created it with a purpose. And I, I think one of the reasons why the church talks about sex so much isn't because we think it's bad, it's because we think it's sacred. And I think that's a big difference between the way God talks about sex in the world. The world wants to talk about it as something very casual, as something, well, you know, animals have sex, you know, so why can't we just have sex? Like when an animal is in heat, an animal has sex. Well, I'm feeling this, so I should have sex. And God is saying, like, the animals aren't made in my image and likeness. They don't have immortal souls. Yeah, that's right, but you, but, they're all, they're, but dogs are in heaven. Cats are in hell, but dogs are in heaven. Um, they're evil. Oh, they're evil. You can ask your priest about the truth in that later. You know what I read that? The Where? cat pachism. Oh, gosh. Thank you. <laughs> Dad jokes all day. Thanks, everybody. Um, <laughs> and scene. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> good night, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs> Bob Rice, everybody. Um, but it's about having hope and about having a bigger picture. I mean, what a great little analogy. Like, you don't want to drive, through, if you're trying to get to the other side of the lake, maybe driving through the lake isn't the best way to do that. And we think that, but sometimes God has, and usually often, God has different paths uh, for that. I, I know that in my own life, you know, I, uh, I remember I was dating a girl. I was, you know, when I was younger, I was involved in a youth group. I heard about virginity, but I didn't hear about chastity. And so I knew I shouldn't have sex but that was pretty much as far as it went. And so I was involved in numerous physical relationships that brought about a lot of regret and shame in my own life. I was dating a girl who I really cared for. We were both Christian, we were praying, but we were also very physical in our relationship. And I went to a conference kind of like this one um, where I, I really heard for the first time a talk on chastity and the beauty of you know, really saving your purity, saving yourself, trusting in God's plan for your life. And they passed, it out, they passed out these little cards, you know, to everybody. And so I signed one, I dated it, you know, I did that stuff. And then I got a copy of the cassette because I'm old. And I well, sent it's, it. It's a plastic thing. It's a it rectangle. Is. It has two circles in the. And you'd have yeah. to take a pencil and you'd have to stick it in there to tighten it up. Yeah. It was very complicated. And then I had to put it in something called an envelope. And... Oh, it was so much work back then. I can't even, I don't know how we survived it. But anyway, I mailed it, you know, to, to her because it was a long distance relationship. She listened to it. She was really moved by it. We agreed uh, that we would be chased. And three months later, she dumped me, uh, which was very, I know, it was very tragic. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, to be honest, without the physical stuff in our relationship, we realized there wasn't a lot more there. And it was kind of like, you're annoying. You know, like, I mean, there's a way that, that, that it's the ways that that physical stuff actually, um, you know, and you know this in marriage, like part of it is it kind of softens the rough edges of things in a relationship. And so when that's gone, 
we realized that we really didn't like each other. She was quicker to realize that than I did. And I was always a little bit bitter at that moment of chastity. You know, that cha- I kept it in my Bible, but I was still like, stupid card. So a couple years later, I'm dating a girl, and uh, we're praying together, and the, the card falls out of my Bible. And I wasn't embarrassed by it completely, but I, you know, I was like, uh, you, know, you know, I mean, we were both chased, and it was cool, but it was still a little weird. So she grabbed it, and she looked at it, and she goes, oh. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm chased. We figured that out. We've been dating for a few <laughs> months now. She reached into her Bible. She had the same card, same date, and that's the woman I married. Yeah. Go God. So while I was having that moment in that room, uh, worried about this other girl, the, God, the, the woman that God had planned for me was also in that auditorium listening to that same talk, doing it. And it had, just has to do with hope. You know what? God's, the, God, the thing God is most concerned about is are you going to follow him or not? That's the number one decision in, in life. The second thing is what's your vocation? So God is actually more concerned about if you're called to marriage, who you're going to marry, than you might even be. And you do have to have a, a hope and a willingness and a patience, I think, for that. And, um, and listening to God's wisdom on this, you know, like, uh, here's another thing. If I had not been chased, if I had been involved in a lot of physical relationships, then when I would have met the woman who's going to be my wife, I might not have dated her because she wasn't into that. And, you know, like is often attracted to like and some of those other things. You know, that are present. I just had a light bulb moment that um, there could be people in this room who will one day get married if you were in the same room as your that, wife. That is very true. Praise be Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's a crazy thought. Here's a question. How do and, you... Yeah, and you're all freaking out. That's right. Now. Like, <laughs> Don't like, look what? over that guy. We'll have a vocations call of like, who thinks they're going to get married to each other? That'll be an interesting <laughs> one at the end. All right. How do you break up with someone stupid without being mean? Because Christians should be kind. Yeah. That's really great. I think that's a fantastic question. So It is. So you're dating someone who's stupid. Okay. But you're a Christian, so you're supposed to be kind. Yeah. So how do you do it? Yeah. I think that comes back to the fear thing. I think sometimes we stay in relationships out of fear because mm. we're like, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want them to feel sad or something, you know. But um, I think you just you just... Be real with them and you be firm. You don't dance around it. You don't leave room for hope. You just say, listen, I don't feel like we should date anymore. And it's going to be hard for a while. Believe me, when I broke up with that guy, he <laughs> was really hard. Um, but you know what happened? What happened? A couple, like a year and a half later, I was at a wedding. Sarah Swafford's wedding, if any of you know her. Um, and... The guy I broke up with came up to me and he said, Lisa, I need to tell you thank you. And I was like, what'd I do? Like, I haven't seen you in a year. Um, this is great. He said, I need to say thank you for breaking up with me. <laughs> yeah, true story. He was like, you were absolutely right. We were not right for each other. And I don't think I would have ever had the courage to do that. And I'm so grateful that you were prayerful and you were thinking it through and that you listened to that and you did break up with me. And at this time, he was already married and I was getting married in three weeks. And it was pretty cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So don't get tunnel vision. If you know it's not right, you're not doing anybody favors by dragging it out. You're not. Because yeah. you're, then it prevents you from doing what God has next for you because you're still stuck in this thing that isn't what he desires for you. Yeah. That's a great ending to that story. I'm glad you got to share it. You know what would be a cooler ending to the story? What? And then he became Pope Francis. <laughs> he was married. I think being a pope would be cooler. I don't know. It's just me. <laughs> um, it was another question about sex, but this is, this is an interesting one. And some, some are asking this in various ways. Uh, is sex okay in a relationship? Will the father be disappointed and send us to hell? Uh, there are a few variations of that, of what does God think of that? Or I have done this. Mm-hmm. What should I do? Do I have any hope on this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say that there is always hope. Nobody is ever too far gone. I think that God is merciful and all you have to do is go to confession. That's the amazing thing about being Catholic is we can be assured of that forgiveness when we go to the confession right behind us here, right? And you just say, God, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't living my best and I wasn't following your plan for me, but I'm done. 
and you might fall again, but guess what, there's confession. Like there's, it's never too late. I can tell you, gosh, from our interviews, like one of the interviews we did was with a guy who was a stripper. And he is now, <laughs> I, I know, asked you not that's to the extreme, right? But like he's everybody. one of the holiest, <laughs> I missed what you said. Um, he's one of the holiest guys I know. He's like, I've got this crazy messed up past and like God has redeemed it. And like he has been chased for like two or three years now. And he's like discerning, becoming a priest, like just amazing what God has done in his life. It is never too late. Amen. Yeah. And so it's the kind of thing that even if you, yeah, nobody's ever too far gone. You, you know, I mean, that's the kind of the one-two punch of the devil, right? The devil wants to lead us into sin and then wants to keep us in our sin. Mm -hmm. And so when we sin, you know, we, we hear this message of, well, you've already screwed up. Well, nobody's going to want you now. Nobody who's pure or holy is going to want you now. You may as well just deal with it. You know, just stay down in the mud. And God is always calling us up and calling us forward. Um, it would be a beautiful thing to say to a future husband or a future wife, I made some mistakes in my youth, but then I heard the, God revealed the truth to me in my life, and from that point on, uh, I sought holiness, I sought purity, and, and sought it in various dating relationships. Um, and so I don't want anybody to ever feel like you lost something that you can't get back. I think that's something that the world tries to tell us, but the entire message of the gospel is about redemption, it's about restoration. Uh, it's about bringing, the, if God can bring the dead to life, I mean, he can do anything in our lives, even in those areas of darkness and, and death. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a few questions about being in a relationship, being Christian, um, how can I keep my faith? Um, how can I stay pure? Um, wait, there was one that was, uh, that was kind of specific that I thought was uh, right on it. Uh, what do you do if you want to be chased and you've discussed this with your significant other and they understand? However, when you start to get intimate with them in a non-sexual way, they don't support your decisions or help you abstain. Yeah, okay, so here's the reality. Both parties have to want it. I know that's not the answer you probably want to hear, but you cannot drag somebody along. So over and over again, again with these interviews, I learned so much from these interviews, I heard stories about relationships where it was like the girl would hear something or the guy would hear something and if one party was on board and the other person wasn't, it just dragged out and dragged out and dragged out and it, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work, um, unfortunately. But I also heard stories where one person had this conversion and, and said, gosh, I wanna live this way and they shared it with the other person and they said, okay, let's try it and they stopped having sex, they started leading a chaste life and now they're married with kids and they didn't have sex again until their wedding night. Just amazing, beautiful things. So I think it's just um, the reality of, you know, is that really the relationship you want? Like, is that really love if they're not willing to sacrifice for you again? Like, is that really love? Like, is that really, is that really what you want? Like, is that really what you desire? Is like, yeah, a boyfriend or a girlfriend who I drag along and they grit their teeth but don't want it themselves. Like, I'd say, yeah, it's, it's really hard. So either they need to come to a place where they want it too, or I have a hard time seeing a future there, yeah. being honest. Yeah, and, and again, that's what we're just trying to be. We're just trying to be straight up. If you can't imagine having a relationship that doesn't involve that kind of physical activity, then I would say you're not ready for that kind of relationship. Uh, because, you know, it's not like what it is in the movies and the TV. I mean, you know, people see each other and then suddenly they're immediately having sex. They're immediately, and there's never any like negative repercussions of this. You know, it's always, you know, I mean, I mean it, it's like, you know, we see like, you know, lawyer shows on TV and that's not how a courtroom is. And we see like, you know, Fast and the Furious and that's not how people actually drive. I and drive yet, like that. You do drive like that? Yeah. That's cool. Um, but then you see like these and bedroom scenes. Band. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. you see these bedroom scenes on TV or in movies and stuff like that. And guess what? That's not how it is either. And we pattern ourselves and we think like, oh, that's what it looks like. That's what it's supposed to be. And really the opposite is true. You know, like nobody would survive those car crashes. Uh, no, if you ever go into an actual courtroom, it's really boring. You know, there's no like badgering of a witness. I object, you know, and most of the relationship stuff actually doesn't work out that well either with things. So, um, yeah, I'm just, just being straight up. If you can't imagine a relationship, what I think is beautiful is that God has something better than the media is offering, has better than TV is offering. 
um, a, a real genuine intimacy, a real genuine love that begins with our hearts. And as you said, you know, maybe you can answer this question. So where our hearts go, our bodies follow. Mm -hmm. want then to follow. our want to follow. So when we start really falling in love with somebody, what can we do to have our bodies not follow that or at least follow that in that kind of way? Yeah, like keep, keep the, the passions ordered to yeah. so their proper, yeah. yeah. I, think, I think this kind of goes with the how far is too far question, but the, the simple, sim most simple way I can explain that question is there's a difference between affection and arousal. And affection is actually important for a relationship. It's important when you're dating to learn how to properly have affection in your relationship. How you know you've gone too far is if it leads to sexual arousal. And there's a different spot for each person. For a girl, it might be like laying down on a couch with her boyfriend might lead to arousal. For a guy, it might just be the couch. Like, that's enough for him to be like, hey, it's just you and me alone in a room with a couch. Right. Right? So you need to know your own. No, one, one piece of advice I heard, which was great, is that, uh, you know, men are like microwaves and women are like ovens. You yeah. know, women might take a longer period of time for arousal, yeah. and guys are like, hey, you know? <laughs> and, but you're that's important to be aware of, because if you're a girl, and you might be at a place where you are mm -hmm. showing affection, and the guy is in a very, very different place. Mm -hmm. And that's where some of that tension yep. can come in. I think that earlier question about, like, I'm trying to be chased. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's even a great question about passionate kissing. Mm -hmm. Like, for one person, it could be a sign of affection, but I know, particularly for a lot of guys, passionate kissing is arousal, mm -hmm. you know? And when you get aroused, you are looking to go to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Affection makes you satisfied with where you're at. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's holding hands, mm -hmm. maybe it's an arm there's around tenderness. each other. There's yeah. tenderness, there's kindness. And you can stay in that place and you feel good about that place. Arousal is always, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? And when you feel like you're on that path, that's when you're gonna end up in places that God would like to spare you from, in mm -hmm. things that really end up hurting relationships in the long run and, and really can hurt and damage your soul with those things. An analogy I like to use is kind of like a buffet. Like if you're gonna go to a buffet and fill up your plate, like your next thought is now we're going to eat, right? So like, it, it's like if you're arousing yourself for something that like is not proper for the time, and it's like filling up your buffet plate and walking away from it. Like nobody likes that. Nobody's like, wait, what? Like, that seems unfair. Like why couldn't we like, eat the meal, right? Yeah. So I think you need to be thinking in terms of like, wait, let's not fill the plate right now. Like, let's make sure that like our relationship has affection because even in marriage, there's times where you need to know how to have affection in your relationship that isn't always sexual, you know? Yeah. Like, that's a very important thing to be developing while you're dating to bring into your marriage. Yeah, and you know, there are so many things that we uh, were asked and they were great questions and we just don't really have a lot of time to talk about. I'd encourage you guys, check out Lisa's book. It's a wonderful book. It's available in the bookstore. There's other really great resources available in the bookstore. If you ask questions about uh, same-sex attraction and homosexuality, I know there's some really good resources there and, and uh, I know some of that got addressed in some of the men's, you know, men's sessions, women's sessions, other things like that. Uh, we just scratched the surface of this in the beginning. And that's what we wanted to do because, you know, if you're not thinking about this now, like thinking about this in the backseat of a car with somebody you're attracted to, that's not the time to start like, all right, I wonder what we should be doing here. Um, if we're gonna be followers and disciples of Christ and live this new life that God revealed, he revealed to us that we're not just animals in heat, but we're made in his image and likeness. We're made to love in dating relationships, in friendship relationships, in family relationships. And could we put those three... Um, just those three bullet points again on the screen behind us, just as a kind of leaving reminder to this. Um, you know, just this idea that, well, you, you said them, so you recap yeah. them. Yeah, uh, will the good of others refuse to use and stop judging, start loving? Really think of those as principles for all of your relationships with Christ at the center, and you are gonna find uh, transformed relationships, friendships, dating relationships, marriages, as Lisa and I have found and all the team can attest to. So let's give it up again for Lisa. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Thank you. This was, this was a fun fireside exactly. chat with exactly. Dr. Bob.